I think it was the second time I had ever even held a baby chick. Mm -hmm. I was very disconnected from anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm taking them out and putting them in the brooder. And how I describe it is my heart opened in that moment and a new dream came in. Mm -hmm. And I really feel like that's when I began to heal. I'm not saying that that chickens will heal postpartum depression. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I got a new purpose and that was very healing for me. And mm -hmm. then not to mention like I was outside a lot, you know, I had something to focus on. I had a break from the monotony of the day and that was very helpful to me in my life and in my healing journey. This is the Homesteading for Beginners podcast, and I'm Mona Weathers, your host. If you desire to start and maintain a healthy homestead that aligns with your goals for self-sufficiency in a way that is sustainable and profitable, then you are in the right place. Be sure to like and subscribe the YouTube channel or follow on your favorite podcast player so that you don't miss an episode. I usually start my podcast episodes or interviews with people and talk about how I've met, but we are just now meeting, yes. which is actually fun for me because everything I learn about you will be new. So yes, <laughs> I'm just really excited to have Dahlia Monteroso here. She is the president of Chickenlandia, which I'm really excited to find out why you are the president of Chickenlandia and how that all came to be. <laughs> But I'm just really excited to learn more about you and have my listeners learn about you. So I just want to welcome you here and thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So this episode is actually perfect timing because it's time. It's the chick days. All yep. of the feed stores are going to be having all the chicks. And this is a perfect time for you to be on the show because we can talk about whether it's a good time for you personally, li listener, to get chickens and all of the d things that you need to know about getting your first chicks, if that's where you are right now. If that's the decision-making time for you right now, this is a perfect episode for you. I would like to know, and the listeners would like to know, like, who is Dahlia and what is this Chickenlandia thing? <laughs> Gosh, I am a backyard chicken educator. I've been doing this I th about 12 years, I think. I always keep, like, the time keeps going by, and, like, forever I was saying 10 years, and then it was like, wait a minute, it's 12 years. <laughs> I do that all the time. <laughs> so I, I think it's 12 years. Um, I certainly didn't lie in bed at night as a child and think, oh, I'm going to be a backyard chicken educator when I grow up. This is something that really I feel has been assigned to me. Like I, I got chickens. I became very passionate about them very quickly. I call it divine intervention because something, some miracle happened when I got chickens and I just became super passionate about them. Eventually I started teaching classes and then I started doing seminars and now here I am the president of Chickenlandia. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so well, how did you come up with that name? With well, I let me back up a little bit. So, okay, when I first got chickens, I was so crazy about them that my husband and I decided to buy a farm store, which was not our best decision that we had ever made. Certainly, financially, <laughs> it was not our best decision. The farm store did not stay open very long, but there was a section of the farm store that was just chickens. So we had like ba the baby chicks in there. We had all the chicken stuff in there. And that section was called Chickenlandia. Oh, okay. That's so, awesome. yeah. But originally that name, a lot of people think it came from Portlandia, which is like, I don't know if you know, it's like a sh funny show that was on mm -hmm. in the like kind of mid 2000s, uh, mid, mid 2010s. How do I say that? Like 2000. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, but that is not where the name came from. When I was a kid, my dad, who was from Guatemala, both my parents immigrated from Guatemala. And so he would listen to shortwave radio in the morning from Guatemala. So 
like every weekend morning of my life until I moved out of the house, I would wake up to like the static sound from the shortwave radio. And then it would, you know, you would hear it kind of dial in to a station and I would hear marimba music, which marimba is like the indigenous music of Guatemala. So it's like this marimba band playing and an announcer would come on and he would say, Chapinlandia. <laughs> and mm. in Guatemala, Chapin is the colloquial term for Guatemalan people. Mm. So it's kind of a nod to my heritage. And also as a child, I grew up in a suburb of Dallas. I was like one of the only, our family was like, I think there were like three Hispanic families in our town. <laughs> And it was a great town. Everybody was really nice. But I was removed from that culture because we were Hispanic. And then I but I was also not connected with my Guatemalan culture very much because I was so far removed from that. So I always felt like I was from nowhere. Mm -hmm. So when I think about Chickenlandia, you know, it's called well that my channel and my brand is welcome to Chickenlandia because it's the place where everybody belongs. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of this place that I created when I found out, okay, this is where I belong. This is who I am. So mm -hmm. there's that. <laughs> I, I love that. That, that I was not expecting that answer to go so deep. That's just, that's oh, I can just go wonderful. deep. I, I can go deep. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's amazing. So when did you get your first chickens and how did the chickens get into your life? Oh, goodness. I, we had, we were not living up here for very long. We're, we're in the Pacific Northwest up in Bellingham, Washington. I met my husband in Los Angeles. We were both working in the entertainment industry. And then we decided to get married and have a family. And we're like, we're going to go somewhere else to do that. We're not going to do that in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But when that happened, I let go a lot of the dreams that I had when I came to LA, I was like, I'm going to be a writer. I'm going to be the next great American filmmaker. I'm going to do all this stuff. Of course, that did not happen. Mm -hmm. So we were up here for a few years. I had a new baby. He was, I think, about 18 months old. And I, I was really struggling. I had postpartum depression and it was pretty severe. And I also was mourning the loss of my dreams and just feeling like I had no identity. I was like, who am I? I loved my family. I loved being a wife. I loved my child. Obviously, I was happy to be a mother, but there was a lot going on. You know, obviously, I had a lot going on. So uh, naturally, I said, I'm going to get some chickens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was the next step. Right. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I really don't know why I lived in a subdivision. It wasn't mm -hmm. like, you know, it was a very suburban area. Mm -hmm. I just was like, I'm getting chickens. I kind of had this tunnel vision where I was doing all this research mm -hmm. and I was really into it. And I went to the store, got these little baby chicks, came home and I've told this story a million times. So if you're listening to this and you've heard it a million times, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. but <laughs> I was taking these baby chicks out of this bag because they came in a sack. They came in like a, a paper bag, the baby chicks. Oh, I've seen that. Usually the yeah. box. <laughs> I haven't seen it since. Okay. <laughs> but anyway, I'm taking them out of this bag one by one. And that that's like the, I think it was the second time I had ever even held a baby chick. Mm. I was very disconnected from anything like that. Mm -hmm. But I'm taking them out and putting them in the brooder and how I describe it is my heart opened in that moment and a new dream came in. Mm. And I really feel like that's when I began to heal. I'm not saying that that chickens will heal postpartum depression, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm. but I got a new purpose and that was very healing for me. And mm. then not to mention like I was outside a lot, you know, I had something to focus on I had a break from the monotony of the day and that was very helpful to me in my life and in my healing journey. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's how it began. And then like six months later, th the community college call messaged me and they were like, Hey, can you teach a class? And I was like, mm -hmm. 
you know, in my head thinking, well, I've only had chickens for six months. I did it. I taught that class. And then, and I, you know, I mean, I was very dedicated to getting correct information and Mm -hmm. doing all the research that I needed to do. After that, I, I started doing some seminars and then I did a TEDx talk at Western Washington Mm -hmm. university. And that's what really kind of propelled me forward in terms of like doing kind of a national thing. And now it's like international, but at the time it was like, I really expanded at that point. Um, And who would have thought that chickens would be the road to that path, right? I know (laughs) it is very strange, but I've always wanted to help people. You know, I've had big dreams my whole life Mm -hmm. and I've wanted to reach people. I've wanted to promote just, you know, peace and love and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And now I just do it through chickens, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) and it seems like the most natural thing in the world, even though it's like, I didn't expect this to be the uh, route I would take. Right. That's amazing. I love that story. See, this is, you know, I didn't know anything about you. And that was just, and I haven't heard that story. (laughs) So that was all new to me. So that was good. (laughs) I've been doing a lot of podcasts. So I'm like, oh, Oh, really? Same story over and over again. Yeah. People can hear. Yeah. (laughs) People can hear it over. It's important to us when we have to repeat it, I feel like. Yeah. So, um, so now there are, I mean, one of the things that you know, chickens are, they're very entertaining and they're very enticing when they're little and fluffy and, you know, like they're the cutest things, especially mm-hmm. right out of, well, maybe not right out of the, a few hours after they've hatched. Yes. After they fluff <laughs> up. Yeah. After they fluff up, they're so cute. And now, you know, there's a lot of people who are just impulse buying right now with Easter coming and everything. What advice would you give people who are listening? Because these are people who are desiring to start a homestead. A lot of people right now are probably backyard, would be backyard Mm -hmm. chicken owners. Uh, No land, maybe just a small space. Mm -hmm. How would you walk someone through to figure out whether they should buy chickens right now? Are they ready for chicks? That's what I'm trying to prevent people from getting. See, I have a story of this lady who contacted me and I've owned chickens for as long as I've been a homesteader, which is over 20 something year, 21 years. And and so sometimes people will contact me and ask me, do you want this rooster? This one lady told me that her daughter went into tractor supply or some feed store, got some chicks and she was contacting me because she was trying to figure out what to do with these chicks that they just bought without even thinking about. And unfortunately, they didn't have any warmth for them. The chicks actually, I think, after talking to her, ended up dying from not being warm enough. Yeah. So I'm just trying to prevent those types of things for people. So do you have any advice for people who are thinking about getting into chickens? Well, I think first and foremost, do some research. Find out the things that you need to have in place before you get home with baby chicks. Because once you have these living, breathing little things on your person, it becomes like, oh my gosh, I've got to take care of these things very quickly. Normally, they would have a mother hen to be underneath her and get that warmth, but they can't survive very long unless they have that warmth. They also need to eat and drink right away. When they get home, they need to eat and drink right away. You need to watch them and make sure that they're eating and drinking because it's likely that they've gone through the mail. Like if you're getting a chick from the farm store that they have been shipped from somewhere. So they've already been through a pretty stressful experience and baby chicks, when they hatch from the egg, they've got about 48 hours before they need to eat and drink. Because if you think about it, you've got a mother hen, she's got a clutch of eggs. Um, Once those eggs start hatching, it's going to be a couple days that she's sitting on the nest while all of the chicks hatch. It's kind of like, kids, you know, like like babies, like human babies at, it's not like nine months to the T and the baby comes out, you know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) some kids are early, some kids are late, you know, Mm -hmm. it it really, there's some variation there. So because of that, 
the baby chicks, when they hatch, they have some time where they're just absorbing the nutrients from the yolk from inside the egg. They're still absorbing that. So they don't need to get to food and water right away. But by the time they get to you, they've already exhausted that time. So mm -hmm. if they weren't, they may have been eating and drinking at the farm store, maybe not. You've got to make sure that they're eating and drinking right when they come home. I, I think it's really good to do research and to find out what you need. But I also don't want people to get really down that rabbit hole of research because there is a lot of information online and some of it is conflicting. You can get overwhelmed and you can start to think, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can do, you know, this sounds like a lot. I don't know if I can do this. And you absolutely can do it. Mm -hmm. Just remember, human beings have been keeping chickens for literally thousands of years. Mm -hmm. This is something that is within us. It's in all of our histories. If you go back a generation or two in your family, you're going to find chickens. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. So remember that and don't try hard not to overcomplicate things because when you do that, that's when you you start to get confused. If you find somebody online or find a book or something that you resonate with, then mm -hmm. stick with that. And that will be your reference guide going through it. But right now is the best time to get baby chicks because we're going into spring and you don't you know, like, there's a reason why mother hens hatch out babies in the spring, because mm -hmm. the springtime is a time where food is plentiful. It's a time when the weather is cooperative all these things that are going to make it easier for you to raise these baby chicks and to put them outside when mm -hmm. they're fully feathered at six to eight weeks. If you get them in the off season, then when they're fully feathered, it might, you know, if it's like 40 degrees below outside, you can't just put them outside. Right. Like then you yeah. have to think about how, how am I going to do this? I've got, do I have to keep them inside longer? Do I need to offer supplemental heat? All this stuff. Mm -hmm. That is complicated for, especially for a first time chicken keeper. So yeah. yeah, it's a great time. You know, don't overcrowd. Mm -hmm. you, it's really tempting but when baby chicks are small, there are these little cotton balls. They're super <laughs> cute. They grow really fast and you have velociraptors <laughs> when they're yeah. one, and then they <laughs> grow into full T-Rexes. Okay. So right. uh, you really want to make sure you have enough room. So don't, you know, that is where you get into problems is with overcrowding. Mm -hmm. Like just yeah. the number one reason overcrowding, boredom, stress, you know? Yeah. So that's so that one of the things you said that fluffy and that fluff doesn't last very long either. And I think people don't realize <laughs> <laughs> that the next stage after fluff is dust. There's oh, a, yeah. A, it's, and the more chickens you have, or the more chicks you have, the more dust you'll have. So just keep that in mind. So, you know, I didn't when I got my first flock, I didn't really think about that. And mm -hmm. baby chicks generate a ton of dust, especially if you have them on a more dusty substrate, like a, shavings or whatever okay. kind of shavings that you have or bedding in their brooder. They generate a lot of dust. If you have allergies and asthma, you really need to consider where you're keeping them because you can get sick. Like it's yeah. that that's a reality. So uh, you might want to keep them in the garage or something like that instead of in your house. <laughs> Yeah, that's so true. I don't, I don't hear a lot of people talking about the dust factor. Yeah, <laughs> maybe because I had, I would do meat birds or do a lot of chickens, and it was like the first thing that happened. Like, for, like the fuzzy would stop after a couple of days, and then it was just dust all the, <laughs> the place. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, but that's great though. So you chickens in a, a like a sub suburb bap backyard like a urban backyard is that what is that where you are right now I did for several years okay until about three years ago we moved out to the county so now they've okay. got a lot more land and we have acreage here but when right. I started out I was in the suburbs and my chickens were right in my backyard and so a lot of my audience and where my heart is is helping people in the city in the suburbs to get chickens because I really believe if you go 
and look at all the homesteading channels and all that information. It's a lot of great information. Like there, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that are out there talking about how we need to be more sustainable and really trying to help people to grow their own food and everything. But there's kind of a missing component there where it's like, if we, as a people, as human beings, you know, if we want to get out of this cycle that we're in, of this very unsustainable cycle, mm -hmm. we have to include the people in the city and the suburbs. There's no way out of this unless we're together on this. And uh, not a there's a lot of people that don't have land. Mm -hmm. There's just a lot of people that don't, don't have land. So my dream is to see chickens not just in the backyards, in single family homes, in the city and in the suburbs, but I want to see community chickens. I want to see chickens mm -hmm. in apartment comp, not in the apartment complex, but mm -hmm. outside of the apartment complex, just like you would see a community garden. I have yeah, I mean, I, I not even thought about that. Like yeah. we think about community gardens all the time, but not community chickens. So that that's great. I love that. Yeah. Um, I, I would like, you know, I've talked about in my book, I say, I have a line where I say, I want to see them on, on the roof, on rooftops, hmm. just like we see gardens on rooftops. I feel like that is necessary if we're going to take that next step and move out of this cycle that we're in. That's really not great for the planet. It's not great for our communities hmm. and it's not great for our families and our children's futures. So that's where my heart is. Yeah. I love that. I'm always trying to help people understand that wherever you are is where you can start, you know, yes. you, like you start in your kitchen, that's where you start homesteading. You yeah. start in your kitchen and then you move out based on how big you want it to go. You can do so many homesteading things in an apartment on a mm -hmm. balcony. I just love it when I hear other people talking about it like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a message that needs to be heard. Homesteading is yeah. not about land size. That's not yes. what it is. Not that's not what modern homesteading is. <laughs> you know, that's not what we what most of us are talking about right now. So, in an urban setting, there are some limitations, or you know, like backyard chickens. So, what what would you, you know, help people understand what the limitations are in those such types of situations? Like, did you encounter any pushback from your neighbors or anything like that? There was one neighbor that said, oh, I thought you weren't allowed to do that. And I said, oh, I am. And then I handed him a carton of eggs and I never heard anything again. <laughs> that is what everybody has told me. Like, if you want to get people on your side, give them some eggs. <laughs> yes. I really tell people, you know, if you can talk to your neighbors first, mm -hmm. but before you do that, find out what the laws are. Mm -hmm. You really need to know that because sometimes, even if you're in the county, if you're in an HOA, there could be rules against you having chickens or limits on how many chickens you can have, where the coop needs to go, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So first of all, find out what is lawful in your area. And then if you have a relationship with your neighbors, you should probably go and talk to them and say, hey, this is what I'm planning. Mm -hmm. And of course, eggs go a long way, you know, tell mm -hmm. them, I'm going to give you some eggs, you can have some fresh eggs. And if they are cranky about it, then you know what you, you know, what your rights are, you know, what the laws are. And so you have that on your side. I would definitely uh, recommend doing that before you get them just as a preparation. We talked earlier about space. And that's going to be your main concern. You really, so in the coop, you want two to four square feet per standard size chicken. Now, when I say two square feet, if, the, if you're going to go that small, you really need to have other areas within your chicken yard where your chickens can get out of the elements. Because if that's all, if like, let's say it snows or it's really, you know, the sun is beating down or whatever. And, and the only place they get out, they have to get out of the elements is the coop. That's not mm -hmm. enough room. Yeah. So you're going to want to do, uh, you, you're going to want to have more space for them. If there's less shaded areas, if there's less covered areas for them to be in outside of their coop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Within the run, you want at least 10 square feet of space per standard size chicken. Mm -hmm. Even with that, you will need to provide some enrichment for them within the run because you don't, you know, I, I always say this like bored chickens 
they're the ones that get into trouble. Mm-hmm. And then they become stressed. They might develop compulsive habits like feather eating or bullying or stuff like that. That's hard to, you know, it's hard to get control over that once it starts. Right. So it's not, and I'm not saying you can't do it, but it, it's harder and you just don't want those problems, especially if, if, it, if you're just getting started. So, you know, a dust bathing area that is out of the elements is great to have, you know, they can have it all year round. Extra perches, you can get a cabbage and tie it up and they'll peck at it. You can make uh, flock blocks for them like a... (laughs) There's a big company that makes Mm -hmm. a flock block for chickens and Mm -hmm. that's really good to like keep them occupied, but you can make one at home with like Mm -hmm. good ingredients, um, stuff like that. You just, you want them to be entertained and occupied so that they don't Mm -hmm. get bored and kind of turn on each other, which can happen. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, when you have your chickens on pasture, that is like, they, they get so much benefit from that. Like we know that we know Mm -hmm. that's the best case scenario for a chicken to be living in a flock and walking around on pasture in this beautiful hillside. That that's, Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's the best case scenario. It's Mm -hmm. okay. If your chickens aren't living in that best case scenario, I'd love to be Mm -hmm. in Hawaii right now. I'm not. (laughs) That's okay. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So there are things that you can do to kind of compensate for what they're lacking from getting Mm -hmm. out of being on pasture. Like you can build, I call them salad bars. Uh, It's like a a thing where basically it's like a kind of raised bed or you can use a pot or something, really any kind of container, put Mm -hmm. dirt in it, cover it with some type of wiring. And then, you know, you're going to plant seeds in it. And then Mm -hmm. cover it with some type of wiring. And what happens is, is that those sprouts will grow up. The fodder will grow up through the wiring. And then the chickens chickens can have that fresh foliage. Whereas, you know, without that, they're going to have, you know, their main source of food is their pellets or their crumble or whatever you're feeding them, which is great. Mm -hmm. But it's important for chickens to have some fresh nutrients in their Mm -hmm. diet And when they're out on pasture, they're getting that, like they're getting bugs, they're getting all the grass, the plant life and everything. And also they're getting exposure to the microbiome in the soil, which Mm -hmm. builds resilience for chickens too. Another thing that you can do is ferment their feed. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you're putting some good bacteria into their guts. You're kind of supporting their immune systems. You're making the nutrients in their feed more able to absorb the nutrients in their feed. So these are things that you can do to make it as close to pasture raise as possible. Mm -hmm. And not only will it be healthier for your chickens, but it will also, that will transfer into their eggs and you'll get healthier eggs that way. Right. That's so true. I love that. I had never thought about doing it where it was actually growing inside of the coop. And then the, the wire that you described, having it over there so that it can grow before, you know, you can't just peck it out before it's yes. ready. But I love that idea. I've never thought of that. That's great. Yeah. And even if you can't do that, you can sprout grains and seeds inside mm-hmm. in a jar yeah. and give those to them. They will love that. Like, that's so good for them. And you can eat it too, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's so much goodness. And, and you talk about free ranging and the the truth for me, and this is what I tell people, like, it's not a matter of if a predator is going to find your chicken, it's a matter of when they're going to yes. find it for me. I mean, you know, it just, I tried here, we're in Georgia now and we're right next to woods and I did it for, I was just, I knew it was going to happen <laughs> and I, yeah. and I should have just said, you know what, they can't be free range chickens, but I was trying and then Fox or Hawk, I'm not sure, yeah. ended up finding a couple. And then it was locked down from there. It was like, they're not going out. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. the Hawk actually even got into the coop once. So they, w- predators can be determined uh, pretty, you know, in the city and the suburbs, you know, out in the County, it's really tough with like Fox and coyote mm-hmm. and all, you know, all kinds of critters. In the city, you have the trash pandas, you know, and 
I'm telling you what, raccoons, they have thumbs. Like they're, mm. yeah. <laughs> they are smart. They are. Yeah. And they're strong. Mm -hmm. And if you're, what I tell people, if a two year old can get into your coop, a raccoon can, they can figure mm. out how to get into your coop and they can take all night doing it. You know, they do. So don't think that, oh, I'm in the city. I don't have to deal with predators. You're mm -hmm. not seeing them because they're hiding from you. Mm -hmm. But they come out at night. Believe me, yeah. they do. So true. That is yeah. definitely can, trash can pandas. <laughs> they can put their arm through and pull a chicken out. Just so yes. you know, like they can, that's happened to me too. Oh, so, yeah. Oh, it's like the yeah. last thing you want to see when you go exactly. out there in the morning. Yeah. Especially you put so much time and energy into these birds. You get to the point, you know, there's their chicks all the way to like six months old. They start laying eggs and th then something happens just because you didn't take just a little bit extra precaution for what, you know, and, and you may not know how crafty they are until they actually. Yeah. I mean, it, it happens to the best of us. Yeah. It really it's happened yeah. to me. It's happened yeah. to me and I'm over here teaching classes, you know, yeah, it has happened to me. So predator proofing is kind of this thing that never really ends. Yeah. It's like a, a Tom and Jerry, a cat and mouse game. I will say a good dog is worth its weight mm. in gold. I have naughty dogs. <laughs> My dogs are not good chicken dogs. They're in danger outside. And the, okay, know, I yeah, have a dog it. to protect them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I won't go into the more predators, but I will say that predators can be super tiny, like weasels, yep. and they can be really big, like bears. If you have a yeah. little tiny hole the size of a quarter, uh -huh. you think, oh, nothing can get in that. Yeah. Yeah, they can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we didn't bring up roosters. What are, what are your thoughts on roosters and whether someone should have one? They are helpful with that protection part, mm -hmm. but they have other things that don't make them as fun to have sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I love roosters and I, mm -hmm. as somebody that has spent a lot of time in Central America and in Mexico, it, down there, it's like, you hear roosters everywhere. Mm -hmm. No one's complaining. <laughs> like, that is just yeah. part of the ambiance. Mm -hmm. And I find it interesting that people like in, let's say Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, you can have chickens. You can mm -hmm. have chickens in Brooklyn, but you can't have roosters. Now think about the sounds in some area mm -hmm. of Brooklyn. Yeah. <laughs> like, Am loud. like there's a jack the ambulance. Going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All kinds of sounds that are actually mm -hmm. louder. And even certain animal sounds like just regular birds and everything that, that are really creating the same amount of noise. But for some mm -hmm. reason, the sound of a rooster is really triggering to a mm -hmm. lot of us. And a lot of people are like, well, I don't want roosters. And I really would love to change the mentality about that, especially if we are moving towards a more sustainable future. Like if right. we're going to say we really want to work on more sustainable lifestyles, we really want mm -hmm. to be different, that involves some sacrifice, mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm just going to put that out there. Every time I do, yeah. the haters come after me. <laughs> <laughs> the rooster haters. But yeah. I, I, really, I really think that... The sound of a rooster is like the call to a, uh, it's like a ringing in an, a, a different future for us, mm -hmm. a more promising future. So if we can think of it that way. Yeah. But right now in most places, if you're in the city, if you're in the suburb, if you're in an HOA, there may be laws that say that you can keep, you know, the ordinances say you can keep chickens, but you cannot have a rooster. Mm -hmm. So it is very important. Number one. When you go to buy chickens, if you're online or if you are walking into the farm store and you see a sign, you know, there's these cute little baby chicks. They're all bantams. You know, there's all these bantam baby chicks, silkies, frizzles, you know, tiny little chickens, super cute. Those chickens are not, they are, they are straight run. Okay. So straight run means that they are not divided by sex. If you see, so uh, bantams, like you're going to get roosters. Remember mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Anytime you see straight run, you're going to get roosters. So remember that. You want to get pullets. And the pullet is a female chicken that has not gone into lay yet. 
So that's really where you want to focus on. But even then, unless it is an auto sex breed, like a, or is that the right term? Um, like a feather, <laughs> feather, a, 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 a breed that it, you can automatically sex it. Oh, the sex link? Like the sex yeah. link? Yeah, yeah, like a sex link. Those are not, there's only a few breeds that are like that. There's so many people that are like, you can decide by the feather line. Like that is <laughs> limited to a few breeds. Most of the time they're sexing the chickens by looking at their vent. And these are tiny baby chicks. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of room for mistakes. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that you might, even if you just get female chickens, that you might get a rooster in there. So have a plan in place. Ask yourself, what am I capable of? You know, what am I willing to do? Am I willing to eat this chicken? You know, and the rooster, I guarantee you, is going to be the friendliest baby chick that, <laughs> you know, the one, your favorite one. Yeah. <laughs> that right. turns out to be the rooster. So you might be like, oh my gosh, I can't eat this chicken. Like I can't, I just can't do that. So have a plan. And what I tell people is whatever that plan is, just make sure it's humane mm -hmm. because every year yeah. a lot of roosters get dumped mm -hmm. and, you know, they put them out in the forest and they're just raccoon food at that point. Mm -hmm. And it's a stressful way to go. So yeah. just keep that in mind. And um, the other thing is, even if you're out in the county and you can have roosters, you need the right balance of females to males. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you have too many roosters and not enough hens, if that ratio is off, you can end up with a very stressed out flock. Mm -hmm. So you don't want that. So what I recommend is at least eight hens per rooster. It depends on the breed. It depends on what you're doing. Like some people are if they're breeders, they might have breeding pairs and stuff. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about just in your regular backyard flock, have that plan. The other thing is roosters, once their hormones kick in, they could be the friendliest, sweetest rooster that was sleeping in your lap, you know, for six months. Those hormones kick in and they can become aggressive. If they're a little itty bitty tiny rooster, you may roll your eyes and just keep walking. <laughs> a big rooster can really hurt you and it can hurt, mm -hmm. especially a young child. And I always say like, I can't stand those videos online. It's like, oh, this rooster attacking this kid and everyone's mm -hmm. laughing. I have met grown adults that are scared of chickens to this day. They were attacked by a rooster when they were a little kid. So yeah. take that seriously. And that is another thing that you need to have a plan for. Like, it, if a rooster ends up very aggressive, is, it, is that something that you can handle? Right. You, you know, will you re home that rooster? Will you eat that rooster? What are your options and what, what are you capable of? And it's okay if you can't eat them or whatever, if you, mm -hmm. if you're like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to put him in his own house and, or I'm going to bring <laughs> him in the house and put a diaper on him. I don't care, you know, <laughs> whatever you want to do, but, but know yourself when you're going mm -hmm. into it know what you're yeah. capable of and have a plan. That's great advice. I love that. And I've had some amazing roosters in the past and I've had some very bad roosters in the past. The ones that are really good, you keep those roosters, you keep them as safe as you can because sometimes they're far and you know can't always find a good rooster. I had one that was just a white rock and he would get aggressive during the spring because it was yeah. breeding time. I just situated his attitude a couple of times and then he would stop <laughs> yes. and then he was fine. Mm -hmm. But I had, I've had other roosters where I grab them, take them with me, do the, all the chores. And you know, like you think like it's gotta be, I, I must've demasculated him <laughs> by now, you know, <laughs> yes. and nope, I put them down yeah. and then they're really aggressive. The roosters are funny. They can be such good, good parts of your flock, but then they can also be just a real, hard thing to have yeah. as a part of your flock. This is the first yeah. time I, I haven't had a rooster with my hens. And I noticed this, maybe you can speak into this because I've never really knew this was a thing, but my, all of my hens act like I am the rooster. They'll squat, um, you know, just in submission. <laughs> 
And I never had that before because I always had a rooster. So now mm. the, the hens are all just like, they'll do whatever I want them to. And they're and the, and the, um, the flock is actually very good. Like the dynamics are good. Even within hens and roosters, like you can have really like mean hens and probably because of what you're saying, they're bored or there isn't enough space or whatever is what causes that. But right now, like, I'm just really happy with my flock because they're all really like they get along. That's good. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, it's important to remember, like sometimes flock dynamics are really hard to watch as human beings. We see things and feel like, oh, it's not fair. Like, I, I hate that. I hate that this one chicken is always alone. I hate that this other chicken's always bullying the other chickens around the feed bowl and kind of scolding them. I hate that the younger ones are having such a hard time integrating into the new flock. These are all things that are tough for us to watch, especially for, you know, if it's a sensitive person, it's hard, it's hard to watch that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But to remember that these are flock dynamics, it's a very strong instinct within chickens. They're always thinking of themselves in terms of the flock and not necessarily as individuals. That's just their mm -hmm. instinct. Yeah. So I try to remind myself, okay, well, these are chickens. Someone's always going to be on the top. Someone's always going to be on the bottom. That's just how it is. Mm -hmm. And it looks unfair to me because I'm a human and humans always want fairness. Mm -hmm. But chickens, they will just think, how will we survive as a group? How best can we situate ourselves so we survive as a group? And the mm -hmm. one at the bottom is going to be like, you're not, you know, you're, you're the most vulnerable one. So we're yeah. kind of keeping you at the bottom. So that's, that's tough, but it, it's interesting to watch. When I look out at the flock, it's kind of like I'm looking at a mini society. I'll always kind of reflect that back as, you know, what does this mean for humanity and how can I use mm -hmm. this to learn more about myself and about my fellow humans? Mm -hmm. So I'm just, I told you I could get deep. I can get Yeah, really no, I love it. <laughs> I love it. I love getting deep. I love getting into the converse, into the topics that make you think, you know, yeah. just don't, not just, you know, having thoughts and not really thinking, why do I have that thought? You know? Yes. <laughs> you know? Um, I did something different recently. One of my, I have a Russian Orlovs, which I, they're amazing chickens. If you've ever, I've never seen them, they have beards, but they're spotted. Yes, and, very uh, beautiful. Yeah. They're really pretty. One of them got sick and i'm pretty sure she had water belly and in the oh, past yeah. i've which is like a bad thing and yeah. usually they die yeah. and in the past i've separated the sick one because you know you want to make sure that they're separate and not getting beat beaten up on by the other ones yes. or whatever mm -hmm. but this time i didn't i was like the outlook is bad so i'm like i can either stress her out or i can leave her and so she was just sitting on the ground and I made sure she had water and food put in front of her, but I let her be with her sisters. And mm -hmm. that was my thought. Like I let her be and she wasn't getting picked on or anything. And I just let her be and she got better. <laughs> and I was like, just, I'd never done that before. And I was thinking maybe in the, you know, I mean, there, there are reasons why you want to separate them, but, you know, isolate them, especially if you think they have some, something contagious. But at this time, I was like, you know what? I think she's, she might just die. And I kept saying, she's going to die, you know? <laughs> but she didn't, and she got better. And I was like, you know what? Maybe she just didn't need stress of being separated. And she just needed to be there. And, of course, I don't know for sure if she had water belly, because, but it looked like it. You know, what I always say in my book, I have the six rules for mindful chicken keeping. Mm -hmm. And the number one rule is follow your heart. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I have that rule is because when we have a flock, we have all these living animals, it, 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 there's going to be so much variation in our experience mm -hmm. as compared to other people. Like there's so many variables. Your experience, it will be totally different from mine. You're dealing with a flock with different chickens. They have different personalities. So there might be a situation where we have two chickens, I have a chicken and a chicken, and they're suffering from the same ailment. And the way to go forward would be different for both of us because we we're dealing with different animals. It's just like mm -hmm. if you and I got a cold, 
I would go lie down and whine and cry for a week and you may continue working. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll probably be whining and crying too. So no. <laughs> I'm like the, the worst. Same. But anyway, so everyone's situation is different. And ultimately, like I give a lot of advice, you know, I'm like, okay, I have this whole method that you do when you have a sick chicken, you bring them inside, you give them some scrambled egg, you give them some electrolytes or whatever. Mm -hmm. And you might read that and, and be like, oh, that's great. But like, I really feel in my heart that I shouldn't bring her inside because I know this chicken that would stress her out. I know that would be worse. I don't feel like what she has is contagious. I don't think that my flock is going to pick on her. So I think the best course of action is to leave her outside and maybe she will die. But if she dies, I want her to be among our flock. Mm -hmm. And you knew that. Mm -hmm. And so that I think is a situation where you listen to your intuition because mm -hmm. nobody, even the best vet in the world or the best chicken educator in the world, like they don't know your flock. Mm -hmm. So ultimately you make that decision. If you learn a lesson from it, that's okay. Mm -hmm. You've learned that lesson and you go forward with that knowledge. Yeah. But I think that's a great example of where it's like, yes, listen to your intuition, follow your heart. You made a decision mm -hmm. and it was the right one for your flock. Right. Yeah. I don't know if I, if I did it again with another chicken, might not turn out the same way, but it was just, yeah, that's such great advice. I'm glad you are thinking that way too, because I feel like we try to put everything in such a, a box and like, this is what you have to do, you know, but sometimes you just have to observe and really become of what each individual animal is telling you. Yes. <laughs> I have horses. So that is something I've been talking to people like each horse is completely different and yeah. they're very big and they're very sensitive. Um, you know, so it's like, you got to take each animal individually. And as I also say this with people wanting to know whether they should add more animals is like every single animal, doesn't matter if it's a tiny quail is another animal. So if it gets sick, if it gets hurt, it, you still have to tend to that little animal. So just yeah. like, you know, but, um, <clears throat> but this is such great advice. And I'm sure my listeners are really loving this. You mentioned a book, yes. but before you tell me about your book, I want to hear <laughs> a, a funny chicken story. I'm sure something. We were talking about roosters. Okay. I had this rooster named Philippe. He was terrible. He was terrible. He attacked me every day. Philippe was chronically ill his whole life. I took loving care of Philippe and he attacked me daily. Okay. <laughs> it's like, if you watch my videos, like I would be like, stop it, Philippe, you know, cause he was just like, I'd be filming. And then I'm like, ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> he was li little, you know, that's, that's why okay. uh, any other scenario, Philippe would not have been allowed to live for as long as he did, but mm -hmm. he lived for a while and then he got sick and he died. You know, he, mm -hmm. he, he was chronically ill his, his whole life. I spent money, you know, surgery, all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> when that chicken died, Oh gosh. First of all, someone asked me, well, what will you do? There were a lot of fires around and mm -hmm. someone asked me if you could save one chicken, only one, who would it be? And without skipping a beat, I said, Philippe, it just like mm -hmm. came out of my mouth. <laughs> and then I was like, why am I saying Philippe? he's horrible? Like, he's always attacking me. It's like, I love my abuser. <laughs> <laughs> this is psychologically <laughs> wrong. And I will tell you, I mourned that chicken. Like once mm. he, he got sick and then he wasn't attacking me so much. I knew it was towards the end. And I was so sad when he died, but he was such a character. It was mm. a lot of fun having him. And when he was gone, it just wasn't the same. And mm. I also was not getting attacked every day. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my funny that's so funny. Story. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They are very entertaining. That's for sure. Like yes. chickens, you could just sit there and watch them and, you know, for hours, really. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So your book. And yes. you also are a big po uh, YouTuber and you have a podcast. Yes. <laughs> so my biggest platform is my YouTube channel. It's called Welcome to Chickenlandia. 
I also have a podcast called Bach Talk. That's B-A-W-K-T-A-W-K. I have an online course. It is called Backyard Chickens 101, a chicken course for everyone. That is a, a very popular chicken course. And then, of course, I have my book. It is called Let's All Keep Chickens. Mm -hmm. All of this information it links to everything. I'm also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all of it you can find on my website, welcome to chickenlandia.com. You can purchase my book through my website. You can purchase the online course. All of it's there. Welcome to chickenlandia.com. That's awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much. This was really great. I loved chatting with you and learning about you and all the little bit of deepness that we got into yeah. <laughs> talking about that and chickens just like a lot of things on the homestead can be an amazing addition they can provide you food and entertainment and <laughs> yeah i don't know a lot of things right yes absolutely i definitely recommend them <laughs>